what we're concentrating on this year. Um, I'm going to be doing substructure. Aaron's going to be doing superstructure. Here's the topics we're going to go through. We've got a lot to cover, so I'm going to try to go through it pretty quick. I'm not going to read everything to you. Uh, those are superstructure topics. Why do we have to make these repairs? What's causing deterioration? Of course, salt. Sometimes the impact that it hit. Freezing, thawing, uh, just age on the structure. And uh, insert deterioration picture here. I didn't do that. Shot creek and concrete repair is what we're going to start with. And we've got the picture of the dentist up here. That's basically what you're doing. You're taking out the bed. He's going to drill out the cavity, take out the bed, get it all out, put something else back in it that's good. We're going to do the same thing. And just like this, if you don't get all the bad out, it'll come back on. So we're going to make sure that we figure out how to get everything out that we need to get out and replace it with a better material. Shot creek and concrete repair. I'm going to be treating the preparation part of both of them the same. It's all the same. And then we'll get into the differences in the two of them. How do you know the difference between shot creek and concrete repair? How do you know which one is the proper application for wherever you're making a repair? You did something. Well, it, it detailed it for us. It details it. How do they come up with their determination, do you think? Because if you look right here, this one is calling for shock creek repair from this repair, which looks no different really than this one right here where they're calling for concrete repair. Personally, I like uh, shock creek repairs always on overhead. In the bottom of the cap, something like that, I always want shock creek there. Normally I always want shock creek on vertical, on walls, sides of caps, things like that. Flat work, concrete repair is fine. Uh, vertical concrete repair is fine. The big thing on concrete repair is make sure you got the right material for the application you're going to use it for. And we'll talk about that more in a few minutes. Uh, so how did they come up with those quantities? We're looking at these quantities from the places they've got marked out. How are they coming up with those on the quantities? Ideally, what you would love to see in the ideal world is somebody goes out there and hammers the whole thing. That's the best way to take it. Uh, I have accused some of the older plans that we got of uh, using some pretty sketchy methods because we were grossly off on some of our quantities. The last few years, they have got much better in, uh, in estimating quantities, quantities that we have. So they use different methods. Sometimes it does get hammered. Sometimes they're going off bridge inspection reports. Uh, bring me to, do I hold to those plan quantities? Am I going to just do what's on the plans or not? No. Hopefully you're going to be able to do what you got to do. If you start making really significant overruns, you probably need to talk to somebody because uh, structure management, bridge maintenance, whoever has put this contract together may or may not have enough extra money to cover if you end up with a lot of extra repairs. We did a rehab on a tunnel in Asheville and we were getting old tunnel, we were getting places where they had chipped back, I could stick my arm out of the hole down at the bottom of the tunnel wall. And we just, we couldn't do that over the whole thing. We had to pick a, a depth and stick with it. So uh, we need to make sure we've got plan, we've got the money to cover it, but hopefully we can get all of the deterioration out of the um, How do you determine the limits? How, if, you, if you don't think that's right, how are you going to determine the limits of what you're going to take out? Exactly, hammering. You ought to, who's got a hammer in here? We'll get to a hammer here in a minute. All right, here's the, the different places that you can find in a place that have got your quantities. Your bill material should give you every structure that you've got on a project, and it will show uh, quantities of steel repair, concrete repair, shot creek repair, whatever, uh, bearing repair, anchor bolt replacements, whatever it is should be on here, their estimated quantity. Uh, and the sheet, like I just showed you, is going to, is going to tell you basically uh, where concrete repair is, where... Let's see if I can focus that just a little bit there. Uh, it'll tell you where concrete repair is. You see right here there's a crack injection, epoxy injection, and uh, see concrete repair, shot creek repair. You ought to be able to see it on this. This is a picture of that, uh, a different tunnel, but this one you can see there's a lot of crack uh, injection that's called for in this one, and there's also some 
chopped creek and concrete repair. This right here was probably the best set of plans I have ever seen as far as accurate quantities of the repairs that we needed to make. And it was 100% sound. Somebody went in there with a hammer and they checked the whole thing. Okay, uh, determining limits. There's your hammer. If you're going to work on rehab, you need one of these. Tell your resident, whoever it is you work for, get you one. Don't do rehab work without one. Uh, the areas should all be sounded. If it's got it marked, that's where you start. You start sounding. But sound everything. I got a quick video I'm going to play part of right here where uh, I went out on a very deteriorated bridge and did a little bit of sounding. There you go. Just a lot. supposed to take a saw and saw half inch deep around the perimeter of where you have marked for him. So you're going to go through your hammer and find the limits of where you think that delamination or that deterioration is at. You're going to mark it with a piece of keel, paint stick, whatever, and he's going to come back and he should uh, saw around that half inch deep before he starts chipping. And that's in order to keep it from spalling out beyond the limits of the repair. We don't ever want to repair it to feather out to nothing. We want nice square edges on the repair. Uh, we want to limit the size of the hammer he is using to remove the material. A small hammer, 17 pound hammer, you should be able to remove all the bad stuff and it shouldn't do much damage to the good stuff. So keep your, keep your sizes small. Um, something I didn't put on here, you're not supposed to use spade bits on removal. And a spade bit means that the head of the bit looks like a little shovel. It's wider than the shaft. Our specifications call for all the bits for the, the point to be uh, no wider than the shaft of the, of the tool. Now, reinforcing steel. If you're doing hydro demolition and you are working on latex overlay or some of the things that Aaron's going to talk about this afternoon, there's a little bit of a difference. For me, on substructure, if I expose steel, I'm going to go behind it. I want to be able to wrap my fingers around the bar to get some material back behind the bar so that material has a good grab on the mix that I'm going to be putting in there to do the repair. Bridge seats. We're going to talk about jacking plans toward the end of this, but uh, sometimes you can do a bridge seat a little bit at a time, do half a bridge seat at a time. These conversations like bridge seats, uh, tools, some of the other things we'll be talking about, need communication up front. When the project first starts, there's some questions you need to be talking to the engineer about. Uh, at what point do you want me to holler if we started over it? Um, several, several questions we're going to be going back to about uh, talking to that engineer about 
just communicating with things on the project to make everything, have the decisions made ahead of time so you're not out there worrying about it in the heat of the moment. Hey, Cameron. Uh, yes. I just mentioned something, the, the part about chipping out around the rebar. Yes. <clears throat> had bridges before, we're chipping out, we get <coughs> good concrete, we haven't hit rebar yet, and we're four, five, six inches deep. So if you get in those situations, go ahead and have those conversations. You may not need to keep chasing to find rebar. Yes. Um, just so you can you know, wrap it around. That shot creek will bond to concrete if it's good concrete. So I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, a lot of old structures on substructures do have the... We got a lot more reinforcing steel than we used to have. A lot of old structures, you might not even have stirrups in the college. It might all be vertical steel. And depending on how long they were, you might only have eight bars in a column vertical <coughs> and no stirrup bars. So, you could get into a place like he's talking about, you could go all the way through the column and not hit a piece of steel if your patch was small enough. Uh, X, Y, Z for quantities. And uh, do not chip more than a third of the way around the column at one time. Just because of what I just said. Some of these old designs, there's not a lot of steel in there. You don't want to go ringing the column all the way around and exposing the steel all the way around. Uh, this bridge right here is on I-40. You see there's two guys right there in that little circle. I went out here one day to this job while they were working, and this was a good contract. And I got to looking around. This right here is one long patch that they had exposed. I could see a bar right here, a vertical bar, and I could see the top of it, <coughs> the bottom splices. The entire bar was exposed, and they had gone two-thirds of the way around that column with I-40 running on top. I was jumping and hollering, and you know, we had a real quick discussion. They had, they were planning on doing shot creek repair. I made them immediately <coughs> start doing concrete repair because the shot creek guy wasn't showing up for a week. That's not, you know, it's not acceptable. Limit the amount of material you take out at one time. After you get the section removed, you can see right here they saw around. They, you see where they chipped. They got what they thought was bad. Uh, removed, what do you do then? Sound it again, make sure you've got everything. We don't want to leave anything there. I am thoroughly convinced that uh, there are many times we do some repairs that we've, for no good reason, because we didn't do the job right. We didn't do the surface preparation right. We didn't do the substrate preparation right. We didn't do the repair right. So there, you know, whatever we did, is not going to last like it should. We ought to be making sure that we're spending this money well and doing the repairs properly. All right, surface preparation is going to be the same for chalk creek or concrete repair. Either one. You're going to sandblast the area, concrete, rebar, everything. Uh, we want a rough texture, good rough texture. You don't want something real slick. I uh, asked yesterday, anybody ever use set 45? used to be a very popular product. If you ever run into that, especially like in the decks where you'll find it, but anywhere, chip that stuff out because it, it's got almost a glassy texture to it when you start removing it, and I, just, I don't think you can get a good bond back to that. So always sound your repairs. If you see something that looks real slick, get it out there. Now, if you have a rehabilitation contract, you have concrete, the concrete repair special provision in that contract. There is a mistake in there that we're, we're correct. If you've got a Portland cement mix, which concrete repair speaks of either a polymer or a Portland cement mix. If it's Portland cement mix, if you're using a double A or a Portland cement mix or whatever, the surface that you're going to apply that to better be saturated and surface dry. It better have soaked up all the water it can. There's no surface water on it before you go. Uh, the special provision is misleading. It sounds like you're supposed to have it, the surface dry for all applications unless you get permission. If it's uh, Portland cement mix, it's got to be saturated. Some of the polymer mixes, they do want them dry. Okay, reinforcement. Most of the time, if you have to mess with a with a, uh, a bar to repair it, a corroding bar is going to be in the deck. It will get jerked up in the middle machine or something like that. Substructure, sometimes you will still find bars that are corroded enough to where you have to repair them. <clears throat> if you have a section loss greater than 20%, or if you lost more than 10% of the diameter, the rule of thumb is we're supposed to repair it. 
Talk, that's another one of those conversations you need to have up front. And a lot of times it's going to depend on the bar. A B bar in a column or a B bar in a cap is going to be more important than a stirrup bar. Maybe you can stand a little more deterioration without having to go to the extent of replacing that bar. Uh, you either need a lap splice or a belt splice. There'll be a detail here in a few minutes. Rebar is pretty much the only case uh, in a rehab job, is pretty much the only case where we allow welding rebar. That's not something you normally ever want to do. There is a proved welding process that the AWP that materials and tests has for welding rebar. And we'll look at that detail here in just a minute. But don't do it unless somebody approves it. The reason we allow it on rebar on these rehab jobs is a lap splice, probably going to be like 18 inches or something. You don't want to chase a bar back into good concrete, removing good concrete just to get an overlap for lap splice. So that's why we allow butt splicing with pieces of angle. Shock creep. You are supposed to have, the specification says if you have a repair over one square foot, you're supposed to use welded wire reinforcement, some kind of welded wire mesh. We also allow fiber reinforcement. We don't allow both in the same patch. Do you know why? What happens if you start trying to shoot this fiber <coughs> impregnated mix through the weave of that mesh? What do you think will happen? It'll, it'll build up on your, on your mesh, and you'll have pockets of fiber, and maybe avoid it behind it. So we don't want to use both of them at the same time. Uh, that's another thing we'll talk to the engineer about. My, anytime I've got, uh, like that tunnel we looked at, we had some overhead repairs. I made them definitely put in mesh in there. The mesh has to have be anchored into the base concrete. Uh, but you know, that's one of the talks you need to have with your engineer about what does he expect as far as fiber reinforcement or mesh or is he one combination of different reinforcements at different locations, but know before you start to work. This is that approved welding process I was talking about. Basically, you're taking a piece of uh, angle and you're nesting the piece of rebar in it, butt splicing it, welding both sides. But again, don't do that unless you, unless it's a rehab job. Uh, 